Well, good afternoon and happy Sabbath to one and all. Special greetings to those who are fathers. I'll say happy Father's Day to those of you who are fathers. Hope you have a very fine, well, whole weekend, but especially a day tomorrow. Having a father is a blessing. It's a blessing for all of us to have a father, and if you have a good father, that's a great blessing. It means a lot to the children. But regardless of the type of father or human father that we have, whether good or bad, we all have a heavenly father, a father in heaven. And sometimes we tend to think about our heavenly father. Again, a great God, a great father, and he is in heaven. Sometimes when we pray, we pray, you know, our father in heaven. But he's not only in heaven. He's here with all of us today. He's with us, and for those who are baptized, he is in us through his Holy Spirit. For that matter, Jesus Christ is also here with us through the Holy Spirit. It's interesting for us to take time and think about the Holy Spirit. To me, it's just an incredible fact that, you know, God the Father and Jesus Christ are dwelling in each of us who have been baptized, that they are with us and that we also are in them. I say it can be hard to wrap our minds around this subject, but it is true. Well, with that, how does that make us feel, you know, when we think about, and it's good from time to time to pause, to stop, and to think about that, you know, God the Father and Jesus Christ are within us. How does that make us feel? And you know, what do you think? How should that make us feel? What about our conduct? Should that be reflected in the way we act? Should it be reflected in the way we treat each other? Should it be reflected in the way that we think about the church, we conduct ourselves towards the church? Turn over to Romans, the eighth chapter. Romans, the eighth chapter. I'll start reading in verse 9. And we'll take a look at one of the places where it talks about God the Father and Jesus Christ dwelling within us. Romans 8 and verse 9. I'm looking to see if I... I found a light switch. Romans 8 and verse 9, while you're tur turning there, I say this is one of the places that talks about the Father and the Son dwelling within us. Verse 9, it says, But you are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit, if indeed the Spirit of God dwells within you. And again, the Spirit of God, this is, I'll say, somewhat generic at this point. As, and then he goes on and says, Now, if, if anyone does not have the Spirit of Christ, very specific, must have the Spirit of Christ, or he's not his. It's not a Christian. Verse 10, and if Christ is in you, the body is dead because of sin, but the spirit is life because of righteousness. And then continuing on in verse 11, now we talked about the spirit of Christ being within us. Verse 11, it says, but of the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you. So this obviously is talking about the Father at this point. So it talks about the spirit of the Father, the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you. He who raised Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through his spirit who dwells within you or which dwells within you. So it's something to think about. Both God the Father and Jesus Christ are dwelling within baptized members of his church. Again, it's something to think about to pause from time to time. But the interesting thing is we talk about the spirit of the Father. We talk about the spirit of the Son. There really is only one spirit. There's only one spirit. Turn to Ephesians, the fourth chapter. Ephesians, the fourth chapter. And I'll start reading in verse 4. And this is where Paul starts to talk about a, well, a short section about unity, about seven items that have unity. Ephesians 4, and then starting in verse 4, where it says, There is one body and one spirit. There's only one spirit. Just as you are called in one hope of your calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is above all and through all and in you all. So it's again talking about the spirit of the Father being within us. But again, it talks about one spirit. In Romans, it talked about the spirit of the Father, talked about the spirit of the Son. And I'm not really going to address the, that issue at this point. I'm not going to address that subject. I would recommend that if you'd like to study further, you know, the Spirit of the Father and the Son, Spirit, One Spirit, 
You know, if you'd like to study that, it makes a really good Bible study for those who are interested. But I'm actually going in a different direction today. It's not enough to know that God the Father and Jesus Christ dwell within us. There's something that we need to do. Something that we need to do. It needs to produce something within our lives. We all know and we've heard that knowledge of itself is of no particular value. It needs to have value. It needs to be put to use. Elsewhere, Paul says, those who are ever learning and unable to come to the knowledge of the truth. They learn a lot. They study a lot. But, you know, what good does that do them? So what good does it know for us, do for us to know that the Spirit of the Father and the Spirit of the Son dwell within us? Well, just backing up, still in Ephesians 4 to verse 1, it says, I, this is Paul, I therefore, the prisoner of the Lord, beseech you to walk worthy of the calling which you are called. And think about it again, just pause. We have an extremely high calling to be Christians now, to be sons in God's family forever, an extremely high calling. Walk worthy of that calling which you were called with all lowliness and gentleness, with long suffering, bearing one another in love, endeavoring to keep the unity of the spirit in the bond of peace. Again, in the opening prayer is mentioned that we're all here together. I say, I don't remember the exact phrase, but in one accord and with peace, with harmony, with unity, all serving God endeavoring to keep the unity of the spirit in the bond of peace. And then it says, there is one body and there is one spirit. And then I've already read down to verse, or through verse 6. There is one body. Again, do we ever think about that we're called to be part of a body? And if so, again, how should we conduct ourselves? How should we think about this? 1 Corinthians 12, it talks about the analogy between a human body and the church. And it says that God has set members in the body. God has chosen us and put us into the body. And for a reason, in order to build up the body, in order to serve, in order to help one another, in order to become one, one with another. We're all called to be part of something that is much, much bigger than ourselves. Turn back to Acts, the second chapter. Acts, the second chapter. I'll start reading in verse 44. This may have been read wherever you were for the Feast of Pentecost. But it talks about the beginning of the, the, beginning of the early New Testament church, of how it started out, of what the attitude was, of what it was like. And it's really a, a high model for us to think about and to look forward to, to try to anticipate, to try and emulate in our own lives and in our church here. Acts 2 and verse 44, it says, Now all who believed were together, again, and they had all things in common, and sold their possessions and goods, and divided them among all as anyone had need. And again, as is talked about before, this isn't communism. This isn't socialism. This is helping people out. There were those that traveled to Jerusalem for the Feast of Pentecost. And how long is the Feast of Pentecost? I'll say with the weekly Sabbath, you know, two days, one day for the feast, one day for the weekly Sabbath. They weren't planning to stay a long time, but now they were. Something new was going on. They ran out of food, ran out of money. So those who were in Jerusalem provided for those who had traveled who were there. They shared. There was a fellowship. There was a communion, if you will. Continuing on in verse 46, it says, So continuing daily with one accord, again, harmony and peace in the temple, and breaking bread from house to house, they ate their food with gladness and simplicity of heart, praising God and having favor with all the people. And then it says, and the Lord added to the church daily those who were being saved. So again, the early church, there was unity there. There was one accord. There was harmony. They were supporting one another. They were part of a body. We can emulate that today. We can use that as a model and in our own lives. Do that as well, to have love, to have harmony, peace, and unity one with another, and certainly praising God together. Turn back to John, the 17th chapter, just a few pages, John, the 17th chapter, and I will start reading in verse 20. John 17 and verse 20, this is a prayer that Jesus Christ prayed the last night he was on earth as a human being. 
John 17, 20 says, I do not pray for these alone, but also for those who will believe in me through their word. And again, that's something to think about as Jesus Christ prayed ultimately for each of us, for those who believe through their word, that they may all be one. Again, unity. As you, Father, in me, and I in you, they also may be one in us. A tremendous unity, a unity that is really only possible in and through God's Holy Spirit. That they may be one in us, that the world may know and believe that you have sent me. And again, I'll, I'll pause at this point and say, you know, how will the world know that you know, Christ has sent us? Because of the unity and the harmony and the love and peace. By this shall all men know that you are my disciples, if you have love one for another. It's not how much of the Bible we know, how many facts, figures, statistics, you know. That's nice to know if it's a value and if it can be put to use. But love, love trumps all of that. I've said before, I'll say again, there's going to be many people in the kingdom that don't know 10% of what we know as far as the Bible is concerned. The knowledge was not available to them at the time when they were called. We live in a time when knowledge is increased. So love matters. Love matters a lot. And the glory which you gave me, I have given them, that they may be one. Again, unity, just as we are one. I and them, you and me, that they may be made perfect in one, that the world may know that you have sent me, and I have loved them, as you have loved me. Just think it says, you know, <clears throat> that the world may know that you have sent me and have loved them as you have loved me. God the Father and Jesus Christ were dwelling together in eternity. In eternity. Uh, you know, however long that is, long time. They loved each other a lot. It says the Father loves us as much as he loves Jesus Christ. Something for each of us to think about. He loves us, and of course, both God the Father and Jesus Christ are dwelling within us. So, brethren, again, I'm going to ask the questions. You know, since the Spirit of the Father and the Spirit of Jesus Christ are dwelling within us, how should we feel about that? And how should we conduct ourselves?